Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spinoff, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. Trainway Silks is where weavers, spinners, knitters, and stitchers find the silk they love. Select from the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. You'll discover a rainbow of colors thoughtfully hand-dyed in Colorado. Love natural? Trainway's array of wild silks provide choices beyond white. If you love silk, you'll love Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co-founder Anne Merrow. Today we actually have two guests on the Long Thread podcast. In honor of Piecework Magazine's 30th anniversary, I've invited the first editor, Veronica Patterson, and its current editor, Pat Olsky, to talk about how they came to the magazine and what they wanted to accomplish with it. Veronica is currently a poet. She's been the poet laureate of Loveland, Colorado, which is where Piecework was initially founded. Pat Olsky, the current editor, is a knitwear designer and teacher of Dorset button making, who's been in the post since 2022. You were the editor of Piecework for almost five years, but most of what you're known for is not magazine editing, but poetry. Can you tell me how being a magazine editor fit into that for you? Perhaps I can. It's mostly begins with a love for words. And uh, I think I shared that initially with Linda Ligon. And one of the things that I did have to learn was that there has to be space for these images, for the words to even come forward and be their poetic selves. But one of the things that I got to do was to write on the cover some lines that were, for me, very telling. This one, the first issue was, for their hands tell a story, And the works of their hands tell a story, each thread connecting us to those who came before, and the story endures. It was wonderful for me to be able to bring that bit of what I thought of as poetic wording to the covers of piecework initially, and we have some poetry inside as well. It made other connections for me, connections with color, connections with thread, connections with history. This issue contains uh, the story of the uh, Triangle Fire. Which issue is that? Uh, This is the second issue, September, October 1993, I think. Mm -hmm. And the cover says, And the works of their hands clothed the living, brightened the dark, honored the dead, and declare their delight, which has to do with these little figures from the Brooklyn Museum. But the story of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire in 1911 was one that really um, moved us, written by Deborah Canarella, and beautifully researched. And that's something that has affected me ever since then. And in 2000, I was in uh, New York and was doing a reading from a book of poetry. And I realized I was standing next to the Triangle Fire Building. Oh, my goodness. And it just gave me, we usually say chills, but it just really kind of opened my mind. And I thought, this is the building. Mm -hmm. And and it was very amazing to think about that. (laughs) I think the thing that uh, really drew me into piecework and kept me in these stories was the fact that I saw history, which Mm -hmm. I had studied at Cornell University, along with literature, in a completely new light because the textiles tell such personal stories Mm -hmm. and they tell connections uh, between one people and another people or so many ways that history is told through these stories and through these threads, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, to me, was just astonishing and still is. I can't, I still can't resist going over to look at textiles, even though I don't know how to make them and I don't know 
exactly what they are, mm -hmm. but it is a just a beautiful connection for me. Uh, this one, this particular issue, which was, I think, the third issue, November, December 1993, presents a way that people, the Hmong people, worked with the Amish on this quilting. Mm -hmm. And their backgrounds, that was astonishing to me, that that was one thing that took place, a combination. And uh, another thing that I will mention is that the fact that I got to write a letter from the editor that yes. didn't have to just sell the, all the articles in the, mm -hmm. in the magazine, but could take one tactic. And uh, this one was called The Hmong and the Amish, Nectar in a Sieve, Writing About Cultures. And it, that was very intriguing to me, to be able to do that. And what I remember really well was to save things, or to go ahead and use things. Yes. Those were my two grandmothers, mm -hmm. and I wrote a little piece about them because there were things in the magazine about saving and things in the magazine about use it, use it. You know, And, and I thought, oh, I know the names of those two women. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fun. That was fun to write. So because piecework was at the very beginning. You you got to, to build the magazine from the very beginning and you didn't have any sort of, it has to have this many projects, it has to be like this. How did you go about deciding what you wanted piecework to be? Oh, there goes a train. We're on Railroad Avenue and there goes a train. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of this had was done in total conjunction with Linda Liga. Mm -hmm. It truly was. I mean, her sense of, of the history was... Uh, very involved in this magazine. I also realized, looking through those early issues, how many people at Interweave wrote pieces of this for us. Mm -hmm. You know, Linda herself wrote for it. I thought to myself, how lucky is that? And we got many proposals from different people as well. There's one story in this issue, the November December 1993, about Hilda Erickson, who was a Utah pioneer, yeah. a Mormon woman, and uh, was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And she went out and took care of women. And it was really a, it's a very powerful piece. Some of the time in Utah, she had to wear a gray mask over mm -hmm. her face when she was riding, because she was often on horseback going to these birth times. And uh, it was very interesting, but she was also a lace knitter, lucky for us. Yes. Because <laughs> they, they gave us a way to bring her into this story because she was always knitting lace as well. So there were just so many things that are powerful for me. And so many of the women all throughout history, and men to some extent, but mostly women throughout history, have done something with their hands, but being able to make the connection to find that thread between what they might have been known for or how they connect to a larger story and what they were making with their hands is something very special. It is. And one of the ones that I was looking at as well was the story of Irish crochet mm -hmm. and how that uh, came out of the potato famine and how it transferred itself to the United States through people who were, you know, emigrating and then immigrating here. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a wonderful actual photograph of the unsinkable Molly Brown yes. dressed in this beautiful lace. <laughs> I think some of those things were taught in convents to the women, but then they took them home to very difficult home situations and try to keep them, try to keep the lace, you know, intricate and clean mm -hmm. and many things that they needed to do. I never knew that story. And I never knew that uh, people who came to the United States at that time could often recognize someone's crocheting <laughs> oh. if they saw it in a store window or, a, you know, something like that. And I thought that made it so personal, mm -hmm. so entirely personal. How did you decide about 
mixing these stories with projects? Because piecework has always involved something that you can try with your hands. How did you put those together? Oh, boy. That's, an, that's a very fascinating question. And I, I looked at some of the projects that we did put together, um, a couple of things that Linda Ligon designed. We eventually had uh, Jane Fournier, who was here. And uh, I remember uh, lots of uh, laughter about things like when we were doing porcupine quilling, a Native American <laughs> art. And I said, well, first... Run over a porcupine, and then <laughs> you know, and then you go from there. And it was just a, uh, but but Jane could do virtually anything, mm-hmm. and then Trish Fabian as well. Of course. Oh my gosh, she did beautiful, intricate. She she was a tatter mm-hmm. along with other things. When I look at that work, I think I don't think I could ever tat exactly, <laughs> but she could bead as well, and all mm-hmm. of them could do. You know, I was not the person who who did the projects, but how do we come up? We try to keep them fairly simple Mm -hmm. and, you know, make a small square of something or something like that. And and yet I think that the photography and so forth, Susan Strawn was also very good at that, but the photography made them important and large and just beautiful at the end of the article. Linda said I should ask you about your own craft practice and what what crafts you have practiced. (laughs) (laughs) That's a very good question. (laughs) You probably would like to know about the striped pants I sewed for my husband back in the 70s, and he actually (laughs) wore them for a little while. I am not much of a craft person, except I do love collaging, like that fan that's on the door there, and there's a... Uh, face of a person outside the door called saying that says I am meaning because I'm a dictionary word person mm-hmm. but I did some knitting I loved sewing but by hand that was really mm-hmm. interesting to me that I that that's what I love and so I put together some pieces in honor of different people who have been with both words and patches sewn by hand on them, things mm-hmm. like that. But I, I am not a true craftsperson. When I watched people in meetings <laughs> use a drop spindle, I yes. thought, okay, I'm probably not going to be doing that anytime <laughs> soon. I just perhaps learned so much at Interweave about textiles <laughs> and different aspects of them from the different magazines, Mm -hmm. which was really wonderful. And Piecework included at the beginning some projects that are needlework, but not what I traditionally think of as textile. So, for example, beadwork and basketry. Yes, Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the story of the things like the Gullah basketry Mm -hmm. in the South and how they tried to make spaces to grow the the grasses and reeds that became part of those baskets. And that didn't work because they needed to be beaten around by the ocean winds. Oh. It was one of the things that I think they discovered about mm-hmm. that. And so, yeah, it was pretty much the subtitle, mm-hmm. Piecework, All This by Hand. Mm-hmm. So... I think things were all by hand, but they weren't textiles in the traditional sense. Thank you for bringing that up, actually. <laughs> you know, I go, I've gone back to these particular magazines, but and I, I just love looking at them again. But I do realize, and, and you said that very well, they are not all traditional textiles. It's interesting that you mentioned all this by hand. Piecework has had a number of different taglines or slogans over the years. And there was the craft magazine with a difference, which I thought was kind of an interesting one (laughs) shortly after you you left, preserving the legacy of needlework. But in the last few years, we've gone back to all this by hand. Really? Yeah. You know, and there were were articles, for example, in here on that were about quilting, but that never became a it was more about quilts 
that were done during special times, Mm -hmm. that were done by people who were slaves, or that were done by someone who is mourning other people. Mm -hmm. One that I remember had these little coffins along the edge of it. And uh, so there was always... Story is really important, I think, in this yeah. in this magazine, and that that's very powerful for me. But things like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, that got into the fact that this was a time when many young women who had come into our country were developing those shirtwaist things that were very flammable mm-hmm. fabrics, yes. as it turned out. Not that many. F- <laughs> fabrics aren't flammable, but but that that whole story and the fact that they were actually locked in on that particular floor that they were on to keep them at work and to you know many other reasons were that's a whole different kind of story from my point of view. It has to do with the women who were uh, young women who were coming here. One of the stories is one woman who didn't actually go to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory that day oh. for a particular reason mm-hmm. and became an activist at that time. So there was a, there's always a lot to be learned, an endless amount, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I do know that. You were the editor of this magazine for nearly five years, so I know that there have to be many favorites among them, but do you have a particular yes. favorite? One that always draws me to it is probably the, um, I see it's the no, September-October 1994 issue, which had to do with indigo dyeing and sashiko. Some of that is magic to me. Yes. <laughs> the way indigo changes its color, the way that so many things are really important in this. Shibori work of the folk shibori of Japan. So many different uses of the indigo dyeing and so forth. It wasn't the entire issue, but it was a whole set of articles. And there's something about that that is really very powerful to me and has remained that way. Indigo is practically universal. There's some form of indigo all over, whether it's woad or something in you know Southeast Asia. Right. And this, uh, the blue and white cloth of Nigeria, you know, I mean, it was, uh, I, and I think I learned, started learning a little bit about that, you know, how widespread indigo was and the different ways different cultures use it. Mm-hmm. So that has stayed with me. The cover on the ocean waves crest, into the evening sky the moon lifts, across indigo cloth pale thread stitches, for every blue a white. And I love that. I love the cover of this particular issue. I'm probably just drawn to that blue in a beautiful that way. Beautiful blue and then the white graphic stitching yeah, on it. Exactly, exactly. Yes. So that is a favorite. But you are absolutely right. There are many <laughs> favorites. In fact, we had a, an article that I, I still remember about birch bark biting. Birch bark biting? Uh-huh. What, what that, that you mean? can bite patterns into birch bark. Oh. And, and I think they are then often used for embroidery and other mm-hmm. things. But... Uh, the idea that you could bite a pattern <laughs> into something <laughs> other than just have your teeth right. in a semicircle is just amazing to me. And so, when you say biting, do you mean with teeth or is it sort of a crimping No, it's technique? with teeth. Really? <laughs> it is actually with teeth. I wish I could remember what issue that one is in. I'll, I'll um, find that and put it in the show notes so that okay, people will good. be able to find it. <laughs> because I, I think people will be curious to know about birch bark biting. Right. We also had an issue that that has remained with me because I have a larger book about Ellis Island. Oh yes. And this was, that particular article was about women who were helping women coming across the ocean adjust to the life that they were going to have, since many of their husbands had already been mm-hmm. in the United States for a year or more. 
And so I think that what they were trying to do, it's a very difficult kind of thing to do, but they were trying to help the women adjust so that their husbands, when they saw them, would not just be, you know, that's an old world woman (laughs) um, with all of her many skirts on and her, you know, various ways of being, but um, that, in fact, they could help them try to find new ways to be so that their husbands, who had been in the United States for a while, would be drawn to them, they would be together again. Isn't it an interesting thing to... I'm not even sure it's the right thing to do, but they were trying to... Um, since the women were coming here so much later, mm-hmm. uh, they were trying to help them adjust to the United States and to their husbands who had been here for a while. That, to me, was just pretty astonishing. And one one article that I wrote, and it was about an object that was at the Lovelin Museum mm-hmm. in their collection, and it was the the object itself, it was kind of a wrap, It would have been donated by a particular person who lives here in Loveland. Mm -hmm. And so I, we were trying to tell that story and I went to see her and we got into finding Ellis Island, the ship manifests, you know, which are available to people. And she was trying to figure out as her, I think it was her mother was coming across the ocean and there were, you know, there were doctors who were very harsh at certain times mm-hmm. on people and doctors who were very kind. And one of the things that the ship manifest says is that this woman had a three-month tumor. Oh. <laughs> and she said, that's my older sister. <laughs> you know? And it was just a, I mean, that was one of those kindnesses Mm -hmm. that was there. Mm -hmm. But we had such a good time discovering all of these things, you know, discovering that that garment had come across. It was simply a shawl, I think. But to discover that that was her older sister and um, how kind that doctor had been, just to say that, it's an odd thing to say, isn't it? A three-month yes. tumor? How would, he, <laughs> how would he know that? But she was most excited about all of that. So Yes. There's something about these personal stories and universal stories. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. I think the personal, for me at least, always gives you a, a sense of the larger picture um, things that were going on in the world, you know, even during war times, there was so much that was kind of hidden from us in some ways. And and when you get that personal story, it doesn't explode exactly, but it sends its little filaments out, um, threads, yes. <laughs> <laughs> into the rest of the world and and pulls you into a different view of mm-hmm. that. That was what was so important for me historically. I, uh, I really had so many things that I knew very little about. That is one of the fun things about being a magazine editor, isn't it? Yes, it I, is. I always enjoy it. I, I know nothing, and that's part of my strength. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I want to know Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. So what did you decide to move on from being the editor of Piecework? You've gone on to, you know, continue your poetry career. You have been the poet laureate of Loveland. So you've been you've been very busy, but what made you decide to that that was the right time to step away? Oh, that's an interesting question. I do love magazines, but I actually love books probably a bit more. Mm-hmm. And so when, when I left Piecework, I went back to work on some books um, for a computer press that mm. was here in Loveland. And uh, that, to me, was, you know, putting together books. There's something about, maybe it's just a bigger version of mm-hmm. a magazine, but actually, I think it was <laughs> probably the books that, mm-hmm. that drew me. 
Yes, I understand that. I, I kind of went the other way. I went from oh. books to magazines, but there is something parallel about them. But I think as the editor of a magazine, if you've gotten it to where you, you think you've achieved what you set out to do. I think I remember one exchange um, with Linda Ligon where we were talking about magazines and I said, but then you have to do it all over again. And she said, then you get to do it all over <laughs> again. And I thought, okay, we, we do have, did have slightly different views on that, but that was really, but it was always delightful. Yes. I mean, it really was good. It has been wonderful for me to go back through these issues, you know, to look at them, to remember the stories, the really unusual stories, but also uh, ones that were, you know, not as unusual, but needlework, always some kind of needlework, some kind of stitching. This issue with all of its ribbons on the front, and this one was uh, March, April, 1995, uh, the way these little, they're almost like little gardens were created out of silk ribbon. And I, I just was astonished over and over again by what we did. Also, though, Chinese rank badges. Mm, yes. I mean, wow. I had no idea. Um, about the history of those and how they came forward and They're so, so forth. so beautiful. So sometimes something just comes from way outside your purview <laughs> and you think, oh, this is wonderful, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. And I think that always has been one of the elements of how do we balance stories that are from very far from us here in Loveland, that are far from our experience, far from us geographically, where it might be hard to find an expert but you don't want to leave all that behind. You found people to write about a wide breadth of stories. Yeah, a wide breadth of stories. That is absolutely the truth. Good. Well, thank you so much, Veronica. Oh, thank you. And this was really, it's really delightful to me to get out this particular set of magazines and start looking through them again and uh, remembering traveling to Deerfield and, you know, just some places that we were able to go, but also just the um, geographical places that people wrote to us from and told us there's those stories. Mm -hmm. So, yes. beautiful. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Pat, thanks so much for being with me. Oh, and this is my pleasure. So you have been the editor of Piecework for pretty much just a year now. So happy first anniversary. Well, thank you. And, you know, when we first started Long Thread Media, I think within the first week you wrote to me and said, how do I get involved? And I know you as a designer who's worked in, you know, lots of different publications, but you mentioned that Piecework was something that you picked up the moment it was on the newsstand. What spoke to you about it? I spent my whole entire life as a knitter, a crocheter, and an embroiderer trying to find out how people used to do things because I just had this sense that people in the past just did such a better, more thorough job of things than the stuff that I saw when I was growing up. And I knew that the information had to be somewhere, and I had looked in every resource that I could find throughout my whole entire young life. And when I walked into Barnes & Noble and saw a magazine that answered questions I had had my whole life, I was floored. I picked that magazine up and I was transfixed. I didn't move from the spot for minutes as I looked at the table of contents and leaped through the contents. I went right up to the register and bought it immediately because I was afraid if I put it down, somebody else would take it. The fact that Piecework was a resource for people from all different cultures and talking about all different time frames was something unheard of to me in the needlework industry. That is such a neat idea. I remember talking to Norman Kennedy, and I, I can't duplicate his marvelous accent from Aberdeen, but yeah. you know, he talks about how those old folks were smart. 
Yeah. And what you're saying, you know, reminds me that those old folks, they, there's a reason why they why they worked so hard. Is there a particular era that really speaks to you? That's a great question. And I would have to say that it depends on the needle art. I'm probably more fascinated by things from maybe the 1600s on because I feel that that was a period of time where people had the time and the resources to do fussier, more technique-driven things. I, as a person, love difficult and intricate. So generally speaking, I think that I find a lot of inspiration in that time frame. And I know that there are absolutely examples of Egyptian pieces from centuries and centuries back. But of course, textiles don't last the way other things do. So very probably they did things that were as intricate as what I see in museums from the 1600s on. But I just don't think there are as many examples that have survived. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think it's interesting to think about Piecework is a, is a magazine about needle arts and traditional needle arts, whether that's historic or, you know, different cultural traditions. But, you know, the idea of a needle can mean so many different things, whether it's sewing or embroidery or knitting. We, I mean, we put crochet in there too, which is a hook rather than a needle, but there's such a breadth of different needle arts that you can do. That is one of the things that I personally find to be the most fascinating about piecework, and I always have. And I will say, as the editor, I'm so thrilled that I can indulge my curiosity about all of those different disciplines. And I certainly hope that that is something that we are conveying to the readers, that all of these needle arts are equally valid. And they all have you know, a lot of information that is waiting to be told. I think we could include weaving, macrame, button making, all sorts of little things, anything that has to do with fiber. So I agree with you that it is important to think of each one as being equally relevant and equally fascinating because they are. It's true. There is something, though, about there are fashions that go through and, and what we do today. You know, we, we do a lot of knitting and embroidery. The, the early days of piecework also covered things like basket making, which we don't think of as being necessarily part of the same practice. It's just not what we're doing so much now. But you also have a background as a knitwear designer who designs very contemporary, fashionable items. How do you put those together? The historic, the intricate, the contemporary, and the wearable? Okay, that's a great question. I definitely loved my time as a designer working with more trend-driven styles, but anything that I ever did was based on historic technique because I am not a corner cutter. And I always felt that referring back to the way things were done in the past was the way to achieve the best results. Because in the past, and even the reasonably recent past, when many of our grandmothers made our clothing or great grandmothers, a time frame where clothing came from people's hands was a time frame in which people knew how to make the clothing the correct way. So I reconciled my interest in trend and in fashion with my fascination for things of the past by relying and researching those historic techniques. So since you came on board as editor, what do you think you found most surprising about seeing piecework from the editor's seat as opposed to the reader's seat? One of the things that I found, I don't know if surprising is the right word, but really gratifying was the depth of experience and the wealth of knowledge that each contributor has brought to every story. Nobody is phoning anything in. There is so much thoughtful content coming my way, and I'm really humbled by it because every person who is writing an article for this magazine has put in so much time and effort and research, sometimes even over a lifetime, before these stories appear on a page. And one of the things that I always find delightful is you let me know, oh, I spoke to this person at the museum devoted to Louisa May Alcott, and she was so excited to share this particular element of Louisa May Alcott's needlework with me. Or I spoke with someone at 
the Breakers or one of the houses in Newport. And, you know, they have these huge, impressive mansions, but they were delighted to share this piece with me. And there's just something about that connection to history and what people have made that I just love that people all want to share these stories with you. It is absolutely wonderful. The reception that I have received, and I'm sure that past editors have received when we are looking for information about textiles in any context is incredible. People always find a point that they find to be fascinating about some textile. And for some people, it can be the carpet on the floor, or for some, it could be the macrame knots used in sail making. They all find something that resonates with them. And I think that there is a a universality to textiles in general. And it sounds cliche, but it is a common thread. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why people are so smiley when they speak to me about it. Well, there's a reason why, you know, you said it's, you know, a common thread. There's a reason why we choose that language, because thread is so fundamental to what it means to be a human. Yes. So did your grandmother make clothes for you? My grandmother was a career woman Mm -hmm. and very much a career woman who was hands down and flat out the most meticulous and talented seamstress I have ever met in my life. She graded seams. She pounded seams. She put weights in the bottom of clothing. And from her, I learned that you can't cut corners. However, as a child, all I wanted to do was cut corners. And I'm sure I frustrated her terribly. (laughs) And she would very kindly say things like, oh, I never would have thought of doing that. But I'm sure in the back of her mind, she was (laughs) she was grinding some some molars. (laughs) Wow, that's cool. What was her career? Uh, she was an executive secretary, and oh. she was she worked in the Empire State Building, and she was very, very much interested in you know anything written and anything that she could do to advance her career. But she just had this creative side, and creative side that melded with her fastidious, meticulous side. And the garments that she produced were unlike anything I think I've seen outside of haute couture. So it was a really great environment for me to grow up with. Pat, I don't think I knew that. And it really explains a lot, I think, about your design sensibility, that combination of, you know, detail and something that you could wear on Fifth Avenue. So you said to me that you have a Fifth Avenue sensibility, and now I understand why. (laughs) (laughs) I do. And I will say that to this day, my grandmother was very, very interested in fashion. And Mm -hmm. to this day, I will walk through a shopping mall and I will point to something and say, my grandmother wore that or my grandmother would have worn that because Mm -hmm. she just had that sense of style. Oh, that's wonderful. My mother was a math professor and she raised four children on her own and had absolutely no time. She was getting her PhD. She was writing books. She was editing everything that she could and taking classes. So there was no needlework done all winter long or all fall and winter long in my Mm -hmm. household. But every summer we would go away to New Hampshire and we would stop at a needle workshop and we would each get a project to do at the beginning of the summer. And Some of my favorite memories are standing in that shop and looking at all of the threads and seeing what all of these incredibly talented people had done for samples. And my mother would pick up knitting yarn, needlepoint, embroidery. And by the end of our time in New Hampshire, she would have sweaters made, pictures made, pillows made at the highest level of each technique without spending a minute on it all year long. (laughs) <laughs> and it just amazed me that, you know, she could just pick up yarn and we would have a sweater or pick up thread and we would have cushions on our couch. And I was very lucky to learn from somebody whose mindset was the opposite of my grandmother's. But they both got to a similar place in terms of this is what you do. You make things with your hands. We're talking in honor of PeaceWorks 30th anniversary. And what are you looking forward to as we start the next decade? 
when I look back on the past 30 years of Peacework Magazine, I am in awe of the way the past editors and the past staff have put together a place where people can find information about all different textile traditions, all different cultures, and all different time periods. So for the next 30 years, I would love to be able to maintain that tradition, but to make use of all of the advances in technology that have allowed us to explore interesting and different cultures and techniques in greater depth in a way that people were not able to access them before. That is so true. I mean, you can find beautiful pieces of of cloth from the other side of the world, and there's an inscription on there that you can take a picture of and find out what it says, even though you can't even read the characters. And that's really exciting. I I can't wait to hear more about those. And, And I think one of the things that we've talked about is how important it is for the community to also come to you with stories. You certainly have things you want to pursue, but being able to call on on our readers is so valuable. The best part of piecework is the interaction and the sense of community. And as we go forward, because of technological advances and the fact that there are platforms in which our message can reach more and more people, I think that the stories are only going to get deeper and richer and more interesting. And I'm very excited about that. I think it's also really important to realize that Piecework has always been a magazine that celebrates women because Mm -hmm. so much of the work that was done by hand, often for subsistence, or sometimes culturally, because women were not as expected to or allowed to do anything else, really tells the story of women. And I certainly don't want to exclude any male makers or designers, because there are so many of them and they are so talented. But I think it is important to recognize that needlework is very often not just a story of fiber, but it's a story of people's lives. And piecework has always had the ability to present that to a greater stage. And that is something that I am trying to do more with. So why do you think Piecework is relevant now? I think Piecework and similar magazines have never been more relevant. And I think it is because we are so inundated with technology and the need to put out fast information and to read best information. So I think that a magazine like Piecework, which has integrity, research, many resources behind it, serves a purpose in our community that all of the things that are on our devices can't possibly touch. People need something tactile in their lives. And working with fiber is one of the most elemental and tactile things that we can do. And having that connection to other people whose interests go above and beyond the surface things that you can find in a two-minute social media post Mm -hmm. strengthens the connections between people and between traditions and cultures. So I don't think there's ever been a more relevant time for a physical magazine that can give its readers all that they're looking for in the same way that Piecework gave me all that I was looking for all those years ago. Pat, thank you so much for taking time away from your editor's desk. And uh, I can't wait to see what you come up with next. I get a sneak peek, but I'm sure others can't (laughs) wait either. (laughs) Well, I will tell anybody who's listening to this podcast that the 30th anniversary issue is just chock full of wonderful, sparkly, glittery things. And I hope everybody feels the way I do. And that is that it just reflects the excitement and the celebratory feeling that we have about this being 30. PeaceWorks 30th anniversary. Thanks so much, Pat. Thanks to Trainway Silks for sponsoring this episode. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again.